Well, hey, my friends, welcome back. Narcissists are self-centered, grandiose, braggadocious people that feel that the world revolves around them. And we see many of them in the corporate world and even in politics where they think their stuff just doesn't stink. They should be able to get away with whatever it is that they want to, and everyone and everything should just cater to him. And the even more dangerous part is when you have a narcissist, and but doesn't display any of these signs, but still has the same attitude beneath the surface. They smile to your face. They pretend they're all sweet and nice, but they are destroying the relationship with people because they leave you stressed out, confused, and maybe even suffering health issues. So my friends, welcome back. I am so glad that you're here with me today. My name is Chris Reese, in case we haven't met yet. We are actually on day seven of our 12 toxic days of Christmas. And today we are talking about seven signs of a covert Christian narcissist. Well, actually even just a covert narcissist, but since this is a godly channel, most of you are Christians here. So welcome back to day seven. I want to actually go ahead and dive right in. I want to give you these seven signs to be able to help you spot a covert narcissist from a mile away, or at the very least, across your dinner table. So we're going to dive right into sign number one is the victim. They play the victim. This is why actually this can be one of the qualities that actually draws people to them, believe it or not. Now you're not really going to be drawn to being attracted to a victim, but if you have any rescuing tendencies, you're likely going to be drawn to a covert narcissist and not even realize it because you're going to want to see, you see somebody who you think is a good person because that's the image that they're portraying. But you know, they're, they're going through a tough time. Maybe you want to encourage them. You might even support them financially because just so many people in their life have let them down. And in the short term, they actually appreciate your validation but it's not going to take long before now you're the problem. You're going to be victimized. They're going to be victimized by you because it's only going to take so long for you to begin to recognize, Hey, wait a minute. I wanted to help you, but I'm not here to support you. So now you're going to turn into the problem. And this is where the issue takes place. A lot of times when we're dealing with true victims, we should be there to help and to support and almost like a crutch. Like we provide that crutch until your legs get strong enough for you to be able to walk on your own. That's not what a narcissist is looking for. They play the victim because they want to manipulate something out of you. And, and here's, what's going to be interesting. Somebody is going to end up saying, why didn't you say, uh, manipulation as one of the signs? And that's because manipulation is going to be at the core of every single sign that we're going to go through today. So in their victim mentality, what they're looking to do is to manipulate from you what they want. Oh, nobody ever bought this for me. And of course, if you're a giver and you want to, you love to make people happy, you may actually go out and buy that for them. Or, oh, you know, nobody's ever taken me here because, you know, we didn't grow up with much. And, and now you're scrambling to go take them somewhere. And it, it may take a while before you recognize, wait a minute, I feel like I'm being manipulated here and, and they're not changing. Like they're constantly stay, staying in that victim mentality. And they often will share their troubled past very early on in a relationship. Be very careful of somebody who shares with you all of their woes, especially from the jump. You know, the, the troubled past that they came through in their childhood, maybe an ex-boyfriend that victimized them or an ex-spouse that really abused them. Really watch out for these things because typically they like to put themselves in the victim mentality. Now, here's the sad part is it really takes away from the true victims out there people that have truly been victimized. But here's the difference. Somebody that has been victimized and allowed God to do his work in them have come to a place of healing to where they can now talk about it in a more appropriate manner and in a more appropriate timing. Victim mentality, on the other hand, uh, they tend to use it to their advantage. 
And the problem is, is this can really begin to mask the narcissist because you don't see them as narcissist. Maybe you see them as insecure or troubled or traumatized. You know, they've had a tough go of things. And many people in life have had a tough go of things. Many people have had challenging childhoods, but they don't go around trying to be victims who covertly scam people into taking care of them. So sign number one is they have a victim mentality. Number two, they are critical, but cowardly. Now the overt narcissist is going to be braggadocious, uh, out there. They'll just criticize. They'll put you down without even a second thought. However, the covert narcissist is a little bit more sly. They will be very critical. They'll, the, they'll be the type that will rage behind the wheel. But if you get out of the car and they're going to go pedaling backwards when they're face to face with you. So they like to do things in secret. They'll talk about you behind your back, but they'll never address something to your face. And I've noticed this with covert narcissists, um, or the people I should say that are in relationship with them. One of the things that drives them crazy is if these people would just be honest with me, then we can just have it out. My friend, they are going to be critical, but they're cowards. They're not going to say this to your face. They will only say it if they've got somebody backing them up. And even if they do say something, they have to have an entourage of people that will be able to, to prop them back up if, by chance, you come back with something that can put them in their place. They have to seek constant validation. So they're very critical, but they're going to be cowards about it. So the minute, here's what I want you to notice, and maybe if you've noticed this before, please let me know in the chat. The minute you stand up to a covert narcissist, or you even so much as challenge what they're saying, a couple of things happen, but one of those things is they, they get very cowardly. So they do not want to, they don't like confrontation. They just want the world to, to be seen how they want it to be seen. Remember, they're the star. Everybody revolves around it. So if you don't kind of fit into that mold, well, now you're going to be fit into the critical, uh, criticizing mold. So number two, they are critical, but very cowardly. Number three, oh, covert narcissists are very lazy. They want it all and they will do very little to obtain it. They want everything in relationships. They want the successful relationships. Um, they, they want the success in life, but they're not going to do anything to attain it. And here's what they are going to do though. They will make every excuse and here's where they're really good. Oh, my friend, they are very good at their excuses because they're master manipulators. They actually, Here's where the manipulation starts. It's not like they wake up in the morning and going, ooh, who can I manipulate today? They actually have this belief system that they have to uphold. So they even manipulate themselves into believing that I deserve this, that things should be going my way, but they don't have the gumption to get up and get it. So they have to manipulate you now in order to do that. If something needs to get done around the house, they'll manipulate you to do it. If something needs to get done in their career, they'll manipulate somebody else on the job to do it. And if that doesn't work, well, guess what? They don't suddenly come to the realization that, oh, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I should actually get up and do it myself. Uh -uh. No, now we go back to sign number two. They are critical, but cowardly. Now that person gets on their hit list. So number three, they are lazy. And one of the things that I want you to recognize that if you are an empathetic person, if you have compassion for people and you tend to empathize easily, then you're probably going to be a target for the covert narcissist because of your giving nature. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying don't be a giver. God has graced you with a gift of giving and you should give as unto the Lord. But here's where we run into a problem. When that giving starts to border on enabling, 
because not all giving is good. I hear this in Christian circles all the time. Just give. All giving is good. No, it's not. Not, not giving to every single ministry just because they ask for it, not good. What if it's not a God-centered ministry? Giving to people who continue in toxic, wicked patterns, not good. So we have to become really good discerners of truth, of people, and of God's purpose. So what is it that he wants to accomplish in all this? So be very careful. If you are a giving person, you may have to kind of put the brakes on and literally put yourself in check before you react in giving. Now, I'm guessing if you are a giver, please let me know in the chat. And if you are a giver, let me know that you give automatically. It's like you don't even have to think about it. You just give. And that's what can begin to make you a target for a covert narcissist. They see that in you. Because you don't stop for a second to think, hey, wait a minute, am I getting played? Now, here's what I don't want you to hear. I don't want you to be walking around with the spirit of suspicion. I don't want you to walk around automatically distrusting people. However, there sometimes does need to be a healthy evaluation. We, all, we don't just go rushing in before we have directions. So before I start to go down another rabbit trail on that one. They are lazy. They will look to take advantage of you. And if you are a giving person, just kind of put the brakes on just a little bit and evaluate and maybe even be prayerful. Should I be continually giving to this person in this situation? Number four, passive aggressive. Overt people will tell you to your face, but coverts, they're going to make backdoor side-handed comments. Oh, must be nice. And oh, I wish I could have something like that. Oh, well, that's the kind of thing that you get if you're, if you come up, you know, if you're raised with money, all of these passive aggressive comments to begin to try to cut you down. They do come across <clears throat> very sweet. They do come across very nice. And, and that's where it leaves people a little bit kind of taken back because, wait a minute, it, it, what you're saying, but the feeling I'm getting from you isn't the same. There's a, there's a disconnect that's taking place here. That's because there is a deep contempt behind their words. They are vengeful, envious, jealous, self-centered people. So they do not do well when others succeed, especially in areas that are important to them. So, you know, if you're succeeding in some other area that means absolutely nothing to me, oh, I can applaud you. And that's where we can get fooled because we can see them giving encouragement or, or just praising somebody's abilities. But the minute you see they see somebody else who's maybe running in the same circles. Oh, my friend, there's a lot of contempt that goes on there because they're extremely envious people, but they're not going to come out and say, oh, you know what? I think I'm really being envious here. I should take that before the Lord. No, you're the problem. This other person is the problem. So now they're going to deliver these passive aggressive comments in hopes that you are going to validate them. And if you call out their passive aggressive comments, you're now labeled. You're too sensitive. Oh, can't you take a joke? I was just joking. My friend, scripture tells us that we are to let our yes be yes and our no be no and everything else is from the evil one. And I know I used to struggle with this trait. I was very passive aggressive and I used to think it was just, you know, sarcasm or I was just joking around. And it was years ago where God revealed to me that, no, this is not an appropriate way to communicate. Say what you mean and mean what you say. And that's what God does. And that should be our aim as well. Because I know a lot of times we can now respond in the like with some passive aggressive digs. Well, my friend, I want you to be careful. Don't repay toxic for toxic. And just because they might be a little bit more toxic than you doesn't make our toxicity null and void. We have to begin to deal with some of these things. And passive aggressiveness can start to manifest in our heart if 
we are dealing with a covert narcissist that now we're having direct, we're having difficulty being direct with for a couple of reasons. Maybe if you have no issue being direct, but they lash out at you, or if you struggle with being direct. So now you're coming at it with some side handed comment, hoping that they'll get it. I got news for you, my friend. We talked about this, I think within like day two or three of the 12 toxic days of Christmas, they're not getting it. They don't care to get it. So your passive aggressive comments are now only leading you to now have to repent for your behavior. So be careful. They are very phony people. But if you look closely past the phony smiles and the fake laughter, which they are famous for, please let me know if you're familiar with that, that famous fake covert narcissist laughter. They all have it. Behind all of that, you're dealing with an extremely envious, insecure person that does not know how to communicate. So they're passive aggressive. Number five, they're defensive. Challenge a covert narcissist and watch them come out of their face. My friend, it is like watching a demon manifest right before your very eyes. And for many immature, unsuspecting people, this reaction from the covert is enough to just kind of snap them back into place, which is the goal. That's the goal of the covert narcissist. I want to rage against you. So now you just back down. And I see it all the time. I, I, I see it in some counseling that I'll do. I've seen it in uh, friends relationships. You know, one of the, um, the partners will say, oh yeah, he or she does this to me. And the other one turns around and she just lashes out and they just completely back down. Oh no, no, no. I was just kidding. So that's what they're looking to do. They're very defensive people. They do not look inward. So I'm going to go down a little bit of a rabbit trail. I, I'm kind of a notorious for my rabbit trails, but a, one of the questions that I get all the time is, can a narcissist change? And I truly believe that all things are possible with God. And I truly believe that I have seen narcissists change overnight. Absolutely not. However, narcissists have no interest in looking inward. They don't want to change. And that's why you're wondering, okay, well, why don't they change? And you're giving them tips on how to make a couple of behavioral changes, which I got news for you is really just teaching them how to be better narcissists. And you're wondering why they're not changing because they don't want to. They're going to change just enough to either get back into your good graces or keep things the status quo. That's why Boundaries are crucial, not to get the narcissist to change. Although in some cases they do, not to the extent that you probably want them to, but to the extent that they're no longer infecting you. That's why boundaries are crucial. And if you missed that episode, I'll go ahead and link that right up here. Um, if you're watching on the live stream, jump on over to day six. We talked about uh, biblical boundaries with toxic family. Definitely check that out. Absolutely crucial. So, Let's get back on course. Covert narcissists live in a manufactured world where they are the shining star. Everyone and everything revolves around them. And when your image of them collides with the image in their mind, ooh, my friend, there will be a price to pay because they're not going to sit back and be self-reflective and say, oh, you know what? I'm really sorry I did that. Or wow, you know, let me, let me think, reflect upon that. Believe it or not, actually, I'm going to take another sidestep. They may actually learn to say that. If you've taught them to say that, they will say that. But I assure you, they won't do it. They'll say it enough to get you to think, oh, okay, all right, they got it. You know, they're getting me, but they will not do it. If you keep pressing, if you keep challenging them, they will dig their heels into the sands of denial even further. They have to hold on to that fragile self image. And that's the issue that comes up when you come back and you challenge them. 
if you have a problem with them, if you're hurt by them, or if you want something to change, or if you don't like a behavior about them. And my friend, it doesn't matter what you say, how you say it, when you say it, or what time of the day the sun is setting. It is never a good time to be able to approach a covert narcissist. Why? Because they don't want to look inward. So that's why <clears throat> they love to say things like, oh, you know, if you had just said it in this way, I would have received it different. Classic covert narcissist. If you would have said it nicely, if you would have been more tender to me, if you would have not done it at this particular time of day or this time of year or whatever, they want to deflect the blame everywhere and anywhere else but on themselves. My friend, the truth is they have zero interest in the truth. They have zero interest in the health of the relationship, and they're only looking to maintain their fragile, fragile self-image. Number six, they are sensitive. Covert narcissists are your classic dish it out, but can't take it kind of people. And it's because of that fragile self-ego that we just talked about. So remember the other term that is often interchangeable for the covert narcissist is the vulnerable narcissist. Now there is a difference between the two and we're not going to get into that today, but they often use them interchangeably. They are very vulnerable people. They take delight in the failures of others, even if they don't show it. Inside, oh, they're dancing. They are dancing, especially if it's anyone who has hurt them or is in direct competition with them, at least in their eyes. Um, they could be the type to complain. Uh, they may even have some toxic positivity and they'll play the victim. And maybe one day, instead of saying, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. What happens is now you turn around and you suggest a solution. So they share with you what's going on. And remember, they're very sensitive. So if you're not feeding into their ego, their, their self-image, if you're not validating them, you're going to be a problem. So let's say you're the type of person that says, okay, I've, I've got solutions. You know, I, I got the answer for you here. Let's, let me show you what could potentially be done. Now, again, I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. We do want to stop and we want to listen to people. We want to make sure that we take a moment to validate them. This is your classic um, marriage partner issues, especially women with men, although I've seen it in reverse, is the men typically don't take any time to validate what the woman's going through. They'll just jump right in with a solution. And then they're upset because they're wondering why that solution didn't make her happy. So instead, what they conclude is, oh, see, Nothing makes her happy. She's just miserable. Oh, she'll, she'll just, she's just unhappy. So it doesn't matter who's in her path. She'll just be unhappy. And that's not true. We do want to validate people, even if just for a moment and acknowledge, wow, that must have hurt. Or I'm so sorry I did that. I didn't realize that. Now we can potentially pose a solution. Let's get back on track with the covert narcissist. Pose a solution to a covert narcissist when they don't want to take responsibility for themselves. Remember, we're going back to number three, they're lazy. We're going back to number one, they're victims. They don't want a solution. Why? Because solution means action. I got to take action. I got to do something. It's not going to happen. So when you propose a solution to them, oftentimes they will lash out at you. That's not going to work. I can't believe this. And, and, and they'll just reject that and typically default to one of the other signs. They'll blame, they'll deflect, they'll play the victim. Or if you're actually strong enough or they're in some way intimidated by you, they may just excuse themselves and go cry in the bathroom or the other room because they just can't take it. Remember, covert narcissists, cannot self-regulate. So they're always looking externally for internal validation. So when you bring to them something that is hurtful, bothersome, a suggestion that maybe suggests, I should say a solution that maybe suggests that what they're doing isn't the best thing in the world, they are going to become sensitive. They're the type of person, now, I know we have a lot of women on this channel, so men just kind of bear with me for a second. So ladies, when we try something on 
and we ask either our spouse or our friend for an opinion, do you not want an honest opinion? If I try on a blouse, do you not want an honest opinion? Most healthy people do, even if it's hard to hear. Not a covert narcissist. Unless you are wise enough to blame the blouse for not flattering their phenomenal physique, you're going to end up with an issue. To say, well, that blouse really isn't flattering on you, or no, it's probably not looking good. You just cracked their fragile self-image. So that's what also starts to make it very challenging. You want to be in relationship with people where there's a healthy give and take. I want to be able to be honest. And I don't mean the whole honest, oh, you look fat. That's not what I'm talking about. That's just obnoxious and rude. I don't care what kind of relationship you have. But we want to be able to be honest. However, you can begin to spot a covert narcissist by no matter how nicely you say it, it just doesn't get received well. Number six, they're sensitive. And number seven, they are controlling. They want all of your time, all of your attention, all of your resources, all of your affection. They want everything. Try to give it to someone else and you're going to see their selfish nature rear its ugly head. And it may kind of bounce back to one of our other signs. It could be met in passive aggressiveness. It could come out in a victim mentality. But the truth is they want everything within their control. Things have to go their way. People have to respond the way they expect them to respond. People have to give them what it is that they want. And if they don't respond to that victim mentality or respond to the passive aggressiveness, all of this is a form of control. And they get this control through their manipulation. Oh, I thought you wanted to be with me because you said you loved me so much. Or, oh, you know, the ladies at church, their daughter spends time with them. These passive aggressive comments are meant to try to control you. And that's where a lot of the guilt comes in. And that's why it is one of my passions to be able to help you understand where godly guilt differs from demonic guilt. And you may be saying, well, wait a minute, Chris, there's no godly guilt. Guilt doesn't come from God. It sure can. I mean, how many of us would actually be saved right now if we didn't recognize and feel bad for the sins that we committed and give them before the throne of God for our forgiveness? So godly guilt leads us to repentance. Demonic guilt leads to condemnation. Godly guilt is when you did do something wrong and you need to repent of your sins. Demonic guilt is when somebody else is trying to get something from you and you're now feeling bad because of a series of events that have happened in your life that the enemy has used to now program you to get you going down his path. But before I start going down that path, let's get back on the control track. They will use manipulation to control you at any cost. And the more it works, the more they use it. And that's why boundaries are crucial. Because if you're giving in one minute and then you're trying to set a boundary the next minute and then you're giving in the, the minute after that, you got to stop wondering why they're confused for one and you're constantly feeling like you have to work at this. Yes, boundaries too, do take work, but once they're established, it's not nearly as difficult. What happens with the difficulty is when you back off on that boundary now we're actually going to talk about that. Uh, one, a, a good question came in, like when, do, when can I adjust my boundaries? But if you're just backing off on a boundary, number one, out of guilt, number two, out of any other uh, emotion that is not prompted by the Holy Spirit, then you're, you're right back in that cycle again. It's like, it's like dieting and then all week and then binging all weekend. And then you're literally starting all over again on Monday instead of creating a healthy lifestyle where now every once in a while you can kind of introduce maybe a donut and see how you do with it. But we can't do this like binging purging kind of mentality. The same with boundaries. I, I can't now put up such stringent boundaries and then all of a sudden I just let them go because I don't know, it's Christmas or, you know, you've guilted me enough. And, and that's another thing. <laughs> Please allow me the grace of one more rabbit trail. Here's what I'd like you guys to stop saying. You ready? Take, if you're taking notes, write this down. They made me. 
and then fill in the blank. They made me feel guilty. They made me by uh, guilting me. My friend, nobody can make you do anything. You have to now own that responsibility that you gave in to the guilt. I know it's just semantics. It's just words, but you have to own that. I gave in to that guilt because now, guess what? You're back in control of you, not them, you. But that's what the narcissist is looking to do. They want to control you. And many of them know exactly how they come across. Maybe they even know that their appearance is, yeah, I don't know, kind of innocent, or they come across really sweet, or maybe they come across as very giving people. Um, now remember, uh, narcissists are, are very codependent. So they could be in one environment where they're literally catering to other people and giving the impression that they're so giving, but you know the other side of the story. And I've even ha heard one narcissist referred to as a country bumpkin by one of their enabling gaslighters. This person was so far from a country bumpkin she was evil, vindictive, manipulative, and that person had absolutely no discernment whatsoever. But this is where people get fooled. They will often go along with an image that they portray. And they'll even go so far as to create the, the visual image. They'll have their look go along with their narcissistic act because they know how it's going to get received and they know that they're going to be able to get what they want from you. Why? Because it's all a game. A game where only I can win. My friend, covert narcissists are extremely disingenuine people. But I want you to be careful in pointing out how they're coming across. Because I know sometimes when the light bulb goes off and you're just like, I'm on to you. I know what you're doing. And, and God just removes the scales from your eyes and you're like, yes, finally this starts to make sense. And you want to dive right back in and let them know that I see what you're doing. And my friend, don't do that. They don't care. Now what you're doing is now you're trying to maintain some form of control. You're trying to get that power level up position. It's not going to matter and it's not going to work. In fact, it begins to backfire. So here's what I want you to understand. What you do inadvertently when you go back to them and you share with them what you've discovered about them is you actually teach them how to hide it better. You teach them the behaviors that can fool people better next time. So don't do it. Leave them in God's hands. Can he change them? Absolutely. Will he? If they let him. And that should be your prayer. That should be your focus. One other thing I want you to understand is one of the worst covert narcissists are the counseled Christian narcissists, or should I say Christian narcissists. These are people that learned all the lingo in the Christian world. They learned all the right words and all the proper behavior, and they can fool a lot of people for a very long time. And I often say this about covert narcissists. They got the words, but they ain't got the music. You know something is off. And my friend, I want you to begin to trust that discernment. I want you to recognize that this is what the enemy is using to trip you up. Whether they're using, whether he's using these people to trip you up by sinning yourself. Because remember, a lot of times we don't even realize it. We repay toxic for toxic. So there, he's got you too. Or we now fall into our, our very own victim mentality. Or at the very least, we take our focus off of God and we, we turn it on these narcissistic people. And we're just like, I got to understand you. Yeah, it's got to make sense. And I would venture to guess that you're probably watching more videos on narcissists than you are on God's love and grace and redemption. And if that's true, my friend, I want to challenge you to turn your focus today. Do not 
make your life all about the narcissist. Covert, overt, vulnerable, doesn't make a difference. Take this opportunity to say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for showing us. Thank you for discernment. Now, Lord, we're going to ask for your godly wisdom. Lord, help us to speak your truth in love. Help us to overcome evil with good. Help us, Lord, to not enable evil, toxic behavior all in the name of love. Father, that one watching right now needs your guidance. They need your wisdom. And Father, I pray that you would give us the strength and the heart and the compassion to want to follow after you. The more we focus on narcissism and narcissistic people, the more we're taking the enemy's bait. So Father, I thank you that you've shown us these qualities. I thank you for the discernment. Now give us your wisdom on how to move forward in a loving, God-honoring way. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. My friend, if you agree with me, can you say amen? So we're doing things a little bit different. Uh, typically on our live streams, we take questions live, but during the 12 toxic days of Christmas, we're actually taking questions from the previous live stream. So if you do have questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat or in the comments section below. Just make sure you put question marks before and after and continue to watch in the remaining days of Christmas as we will possibly answer your question on one of our upcoming episodes. So one of the questions that came in that I want to address is how do you know when to adjust or remove your boundaries? This was a really good question and it came in in yesterday's teaching when we were talking about biblical boundaries with toxic family. And it's such a prevalent issue that we actually have a course that I created called Biblical Boundaries with Toxic Family, where we start to dive deep into the four types of boundaries, when they're needed, how to apply them, and when you can start to make that adjustment. So if boundaries are what you're struggling with, I want to encourage you to go check out that course online. Uh, we'll actually post a link to it in the, in the chat as well as in the description section below. In fact, we'll, we'll go ahead and pop a link in the chat and the description for a collection of all of our courses. And I'm really excited to announce that between now and December 23rd, every single one of these courses is on sale for 20% off. Yes, everything from conquering codependency to renewing your mind to dealing with a toxic mother, every single one of these courses are on sale for 20% off. All you need to do is type in code HOLIDAY20 and you will get your discount for any and all courses. So definitely jump on over, take advantage of that. But this is a really good question that we dive deep into in the course, but I wanna to touch on it today. So you know when to adjust or to remove your boundaries based upon behavior. So sometimes boundaries can be a starting point for somebody, other times they're a crutch. Meaning, if I'm dealing with a healthy person, somewhat healthy, and I create a boundary and I have it in place long enough for you to now become acclimated to it and recognize that this is a healthy way of relating, well, then maybe at that point I can adjust or I can remove my boundary or I can make it a little bit looser. I don't have to be so strict and stringent. I want you to think of this almost like the way we would raise children. And I don't mean to be disrespectful in any way, like calling adults children, but narcissists are children. They really are. They're very immature in their, their mannerisms, their behaviors, uh, their, their mindsets, their emotional stability. They're, they're children. So what I'm looking to do is to see if that crutch can now get taken away. If this was now a stepping stone for you, like, okay, I don't have to be so strict in these boundaries. So for example, when I was raising my daughter, there were certain boundaries that I had to put in place. You know, you can go outside and play, but we don't cross this street. We don't cross this boundary line. I have to keep you within those parameters. And as she grew older and I saw that she was making wiser, smarter, more godly decisions, 
the boundary line got pushed. And in some cases, it just got erased because I could trust her. So that's really what it's going to come down to. It is going to come down to trust. So how do I know if I can trust somebody if I've just created a boundary? So could you imagine? <laughs> I think my daughter's going to be 28 this year. So we correct me if I'm wrong. But could you imagine if I still have the same boundaries on her? Don't cross this street and don't go outside those lines, which with all due respect, some parents are taking a little too far. Could you imagine if I still had that same boundary for her? I would never know if she could be trusted if I didn't move the boundary a little bit. So how I begin to move, decide whether I need to move that boundary is by testing. And you can just kind of move it just a little bit and see what they do. If they disrespect the boundary, then it wasn't a stepping stone. Your boundary is a crutch. And either way, it's still got to stay there because your boundary protects you. But now you know, okay, that boundary has got to stay there. I really can't trust this person to have, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Self-induced boundaries. Some people have them, some don't. I hope that answers your question. Okay, my friend, we are actually running low on time. So my last question for you is for you. What other traits do you see in a covert narcissist? Let me know in the comments section below. And if you are struggling with a toxic relationship, I want to encourage you again, check out of our check out our online courses. We popped a link in the chat in the description. 20% off every single one of them. If you want to know the seven gaslighting phrases that a narcissist is going to use to try to control you, go ahead and check out this video right here. If you're watching on the live, I think it's day three, jump back to day three and you can check that out. If you want to learn how to deal with toxic people, I want to invite you to grab our free toxic people survival guide. I'll go ahead and include a link in the description and we've also popped it in the chat as well. Okay, my friend, I hope that you will join me for day eight tomorrow as we continue to journey on the 12 toxic days of Christmas. We are going live at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please say that you'll be there. Until then, remember, all things are possible with God. Bye for now.